The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good morning to you, Kobus. Good morning. Kobus, earlier this month, the Chinese government released a new white paper on its international development assistance. Now, this came out of the State Council, and for those of you not familiar with what the State Council is, it's kind of like what the cabinet is in the U.S. government. Not really a one-for-one, one, but it's very important. And when this white paper dropped, it got a lot of people very, very interested. In fact, I think, Kobus, you were saying that for development nerds like yourself, it was fascinating reading, and people were just pouring through it. Not the most exciting reading for the rest of us, so I'm really excited, Kobus, that you're going to be here to help us explain it and take a, a look at it. The paper is entitled China International Development Cooperation in the New Era, and it replaces two white papers on Chinese foreign aid. And in fact, it's uh, at 26,000 characters long. This thing is enormous. It's longer than both of the previous documents combined. Uh, so that is really how important this thing is, just in terms of the sheer heft of it. Now, the paper revealed some interesting data on uh, on what the Chinese are doing in their international development and cooperation uh, assistance. And we always love when we get some numbers, especially that come directly from the Chinese government. Uh, they said that between 2013 and 2018, the Chinese spent about $42 billion in aid programs, which comes out to be more or less about $7 billion a year. Now, that number would make China the seventh largest sovereign donor after the U.S., Germany, the United Kingdom, Japan, France, and Turkey. And what's interesting is that I think, Kobus, when this paper came out and on Twitter, some of the reactions that I got was, China does aid? Hmm, I didn't know that. Because China's not really well known, especially in places like Africa, for its development assistance and its foreign aid programs. And I think it took a lot of people by surprise, Kobus. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And one obviously then has to make the distinction between aid and all of the other financing that China is doing in places like Africa. Um, you know, so, so you know, that'll, that'll be good to, to unpack. But, but it was a very interesting reading. It, for me particularly, it was also really interesting just to see the breadth of Chinese engagement in the world. You know, so, so obviously there's a lot in Africa and Africa remains a, a, a centerpiece of, of all of this work. But, but it is interesting to see African places popping up and then kind of mixed in with like Kyrgyzstan, Jamaica, you know, like literally like China is really massive in terms of its, its its engagement with the global south, you know, it's it's it really is present everywhere. It's not surprising that a lot of people are not familiar with the Chinese aid agencies and the approach and what they do, because really up until 2018, the Chinese didn't even have a dedicated aid agency. So in 2018, they, they launched the new China International Development Cooperation Agency, and that's intended to be something like what USAID is, Japan International Cooperation Agency, the old DFID, you know, these traditional development agencies. Up until 2018, aid was handled through various ministries, namely uh, the Ministry of Commerce. And a lot of it was very secretive, and it was folded into various other projects, and it was very hard to figure out. One of the things that really stood out, though, and the Chinese really talked about this quite a bit, was the disproportionate importance of Africa. That even in uh, in the time before when they had an aid agency, they touted how the bulk of their foreign assistance went to Africa. So there's a lot at stake here for Africa in this new white paper. And we wanted to make sure that we bring you some expert analysis on this from somebody who really knows this stuff. We don't really know it that well. So we wanted to really make sure we brought somebody to you who can give us the insights on that. And for that, we are thrilled to have on the program for the first time uh, one of my favorite people I've been following on Twitter for a number of years and following her research, Stella Hongzhang, is a PhD candidate at George Mason University in the United States and definitely one of the world's leading experts on Chinese aid and international development. And she joins us from her hometown in Chenzhou in Fujian province. I think the first time we've had somebody 
on the show direct from Fujian province. A very good afternoon to you, Stella. Good afternoon to you. Thank you. It's really great to have you on the show to be able to break down for us the importance of this new document and why the white paper is, is so interesting. And you really wrote about it in a multi-part Twitter thread within a day of, of it coming out. And one of the things you said right off the top in your first tweet was that this is a landmark document. Why is it a landmark document? Um, so, of course, for the first time, it used the term international development cooperation. It replaces the previous white papers on foreign aid. So I think, in, in a way, this is a much more high-level um, white paper than the previous ones. And it also... Um, um, takes a, uh, the, the space to explain China's principles, China's um, or approaches to international development cooperation, how, how China thinks about this concept, which is still a, a new concept, I would say. And and also um, and it, also I think it I I would I would the way I would put this white paper is it's, it's a manifesto of China's. Um, intention to be to play a leadership role in in global development. So yeah, it, it's a very exciting document to read. I agree. It's, it's interesting to call it a manifesto, and, and you know, kind of what what are some of these kind of core principles that 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 you saw emerging in this document? Um, so the principles are not so new. They have been talked about over the years, and but this is the first document that put everything together. Um, of course, the the long existing principle of um, you know respecting the the sovereignty of all the other nations and and you know equal development, equal relationship between the development partners, and these are still there. And also um, um, the non interference of uh, domestic affairs. It was not stressed as much in this document, but I think the idea is still there too. Um, what I have discovered something more interesting is the uh, there is a Confucian concept of you know uh, the term used in the Chinese document is guan, which is translated into the the correct view or the righteous view on justice versus interest. So, um, and this concept has been used in Chinese foreign policy um, um, as, as a guidance for China's foreign policy during um, Xi Jinping's leadership, during his uh, presidency, um, to, to really uh, provide a kind of doctrine a moral doctrine for China to approach its international relations, especially with developing countries. So, what China can do, what what China, sh uh, how China should position itself in its international engagements, and how to balance um, the interests with the the public good. Um, so, I think this is another very interesting concept that's in in the document, and that I want to highlight. Um, and also, there are also principles about. Um, you know, helping developing countries to develop their own, their independent um, uh, uh, capacity. Um, um, I think the term used in, in the English version is the endogenous growth, which is very interesting because uh, when you think about that, that term, which is a very academic term, endogenous growth, is pro probably in contrast to the idea of, you know, aid being a kind of financial uh, redistribution uh, the redistribution of wealth. Um, so you move part of the wealth from the richer countries um, in the global north to to the global south, so that um, they can they can develop. Because you know development or growth is is conceptualized as you know lack of capital. So you, once you put some additional capital to that economy, they will grow. So I think the, the, this term endogenous growth that China is putting forward would uh, would be highlighting the kind of idea that um, they want to help these countries build their you know domestic capacity so that they can find their ways you know to reorganize their resources to make use of their resources and in order to achieve the goal of growth and development. So I think all these um, ideas are, are very interesting and, and a lot to unpack. Um, but, but of course, these um, appear very nice, very nicely on paper. We still need to see how they are put into practice. Yeah. Let, before we get into the practice, I want to stay with the semantics because the, the language is really interesting and I think very complicated for outsiders to understand. Two words that you brought up, you said public good and interest. And this word public good came up earlier in May 
when President Xi Jinping at the World Health Assembly said that China's vaccines will be made available as a public good. And people didn't really understand mm -hmm. what that meant. Then over the summer, we just assumed up until then that it was a public good would mean they would give it away for free. Because when we've talked about public goods, say, in the United States context, in the, in the post Bretton Woods era, the United States, for example, will provide military security in many parts of the world as a public good to facilitate trade. It does not send a bill to countries in, you know, in the Pacific or in the Atlantic because it's providing protection there. And I think so that concept mm -hmm. of a public good was very much framed in a Western, traditional, European, U.S. kind of context. But the public good started to evolve when the Chinese government started to say, well, we're not going to give it away. We're going to charge. And then we're going to start giving it away or charging it at different rates depending on a country's development status. And the notion of public good became very confusing then at that point. So I'm curious if you could help us better understand what the word public good means in a Chinese context and also in the context of what we're seeing in this document. Um, okay, so um, uh, the the way I just um, put it, uh, public good, um, is how I translated the uh, the Chinese term used in the document E, uh, which is a uh, you know a concept from classic classical Confucian texts, and it could be also translated as justice. So this is a more abstract um, idea about you know what's good for uh, you know for the mankind, you know some kind of. Um, greater goods rather than just, you know, specific materialist interests. And of, and of course, China has been using the concept public goods in the international forum. And I think uh, in a way it is a kind of appropriation or uh, adoption of the, the kind of language that's more commonly used in, in you know, Western countries. Um, it, it's, I think, uh, since Xi Jinping came into power, he has been very actively promoting this idea of, you know, China um, is uh, will be providing this kind of public goods for for global development that will include everything from, you know, what you were saying about, you know, uh, public health, medical supplies, and you know, just uh, the resources for development and the ideas for development, um, so that you know it can everyone can benefit from it. Um, it's yeah, it's it's a very abstract idea, and and how you translate these philosophical notions into practice, and it's also of, of course a lot of controversies will come when you know when people see various problems in in, in practice, um, but this notion is is I think it's a hallmark of Xi Jinping's presidency has been trying to do that and trying to play the role you know promote this image of China being a leader, playing, you know, uh, taking up the responsibilities of a leader in, in the global development um, space. I've seen some commentators, um, you know, saying in, in response to the white paper that, that it indicates a shift um, in China from a focus on aid to a focus on development. Um, I wonder if, if, you, um, if you agree with that. And, and also, like, how, how are the two different? Like, you know, it's, it's a very basic question, but like, what is actually the difference um, in aid and uh, between an aid focus and a development focus? Yeah, I I don't think you know China was too much focused on the aid concept of aid. I think China has always been um, seeing aid as you know part of uh, some broader categories, like um, before this in international development cooperation IDC concept became you know fashionable in the in the in the space of international development. Um, China has had its own concept, which was like um, uh, international economic cooperation. Actually, that that was a term China used more commonly when it you know signed agreements with other countries when they when China provided aid. Um, so this international economic cooperation was also a concept that was born in the South South uh, cooperation contest. So it includes various kinds of activities, you know, not just including aid, but also um, the, the, the investment or, you know, contracting services, policy cooperation. So, you know, China tends to lump all these various things together. And, and aid, of course, um, was something more specific. And it was, it started in the Chinese context from, you know, China's provision of aid to Vietnam during the Vietnam War. 
Um, so it had it started with a very different origin, um, very much motivated by ideology. You know, China was su- supporting all these socialist countries, and later on, in starting from the 50s, China started to use aid to um, as a means of as a tool of economic diplomacy to you know make friends with countries in Africa and in Latin America. Um, and so that was during the 50s, 60s, and 70s, um, and China provided a lot of aid um, in those times. Um, actually, it was beyond China's cap- capability. China provided, provided probably too much aid in comparison to what it could afford. And so since the late 70s, starting from 80s, as China, you know, um, changed the direction, you know, focused on economic development, aid was also... Um, reconceptualized as part of the, you know, broader economic activities in which, through which China can, you know, develop relationships, um, economic relationships and other kind of ties with other countries. And also China explicitly used aid to promote its own um, industries, like construction industries. Um, And so, yeah, and, and, and in a way, I agree with what you were citing about the argument that you were citing that, um, you know, in recent years, China started to put more focus on the the concept of development. And I think that's in part um, responding to the, the global trends to change the kind of language that's used in this space, because it used to be just, you know, people talking about aid, talking about recipient and donor relationship and and but but that kind of language suggested kind of unequal relationship so in recent years there's been the movement to shift to the language of development cooperation development partnership so in a way i think china's adoption of this term is um, responding to that trend but um in uh, um, and but in addition, in addition, like what I was saying, you know, China under Xi Jinping's leadership is trying to think about, you know, in what way it could, um, it could become um, a legitimate uh, uh, leader in some space. It can become a, a you know, to k- take up the responsibilities of a major country, uh, the term China likes to use in its foreign policy talks. And and they think about development because, you know, China is the largest developing country in the world. That's always been the way China identifies itself. And, and China has been active in providing aid um, to African countries and other countries um, for many years now. Um, so there's something that China feels that it has learned. It has developed a, a system and it's become increasingly confident in the system that it has developed developed and it wants to promote this. So I think all these things come together um, that resulted in China's uh, officially adoption of this term um, reflected in the name of the agency and now um, we're seeing in this document. Yeah, there's so much depth here. And so let I just want to take a couple of the currents that you've talked about. So you've mentioned the word morality and morals. You've mentioned Confucianism. And then you've talked about some of the Mao era aid initiatives in places like Africa, thinking about the Tazara Railway or what Mao did here in Vietnam Mm -hmm. as well. But those felt very strategic. They felt that aid in Mm -hmm. many ways was an extension of foreign policy. Certainly during the Cold War, aid was used as part of the, you know, the geopolitical struggle that was going on, the anti-colonial struggles that were going on. Whereas aid in the in the U.S. and Europe, at least the way we talk about it ourselves, is there is a Judeo-Christian value structure that we should be helping poor people, we should be helping the less fortunate, and it's very so. So even though there are very serious geopolitical considerations related to U.S. and European aid, there is a strong component among the people that it is the right thing to do that a wealthy country helps a poor country. That is just, that's the ethic of it. And I think that's what allows Congress, for example, in the United States to keep aid budgets going and people do support it because they do think it's the morally the right thing to do. That same culture is not present in China because Confucian values do not emphasize that the same way that Judeo-Christian values do. In fact, aid is seen by many people in China as a very controversial thing. We are a developing country. Why are we giving so much money to other poor countries when we need it here at home? Of course, that is an argument that we hear a lot in the U.S. and Europe, to be sure, as well. But so talk to me a little bit about this idea of the, the morality of aid as it's seen in China. 
And whether or not it is a moral issue, such as what we talked about in the United States, or is this still really an extension of or an evolution of what Mao was using aid for, for geopolitical and economic advantage? Yeah, I think um, the use of aid for geopolitical advantage or strategic purposes, they will always be there. Um, I, I have no doubt about that. And it would be naive to think that any country is purely altruistic in providing aid. Um, so, of course, aid in, in China, um, China would continue to use aid for these purposes and also uh, also very explicitly stated in the document would use aid um, in, in uh, coordination with the overall BRI agenda, which is also kind of strategic. Um, so... And those will be still there, um, but the use the the the, uh, the making of this discourse about the morality of providing aid, um, that's yeah, I agree. That's something very interesting. Like you said, um, th- this element used to be lacking um, for a long time in China's foreign aid. Of course, there's always been you know the talk about about internationalism, you know, brotherhood of developing countries, um, but for I think in the period between 80s and, and 2010s, um, the, it because of aid was so much considered as part of the economic activity, people tend to be you know very pragmatic about aid and and in practical terms, aid has been just aid was approached as a kind of you know almost as a commercial activity. So there was not such so much talk about you know the morality at least in the in the policy discourses, but I think um, uh, this again I want you to uh, emphasize that the, the Xi Jinping's the leadership has been putting um, it, it, it's over in overall terms it's not just in foreign aid um, it, and also in other um, areas of governance he has been trying to. Um, draw from you know Chinese traditional cultures and traditional values to you know put these ideas, you know these normative ideas into what the government is doing, and of course a lot of it remain very aloof and very I, I'm not sure you know ordinary people are paying attention to that, but I think it's in a way uh, to mobilize the, the at least the, the the Chinese officials, the technocrats who are working in these spaces to feel that um, what they are doing is to serve something, uh, some greater good rather than, you know, just very pragmatic, just for the interest. Yeah, but but the, the ordinary people are paying attention to some part of it. Again, like in other countries, I remember in 2018, uh, after FOCAC in Beijing, the Chinese government had to censor mentions of the $60 billion package because it started going on social media that people were very upset about all this money going to Africa. They didn't actually specify that a lot of that money was in loans and in concessional loans and whatnot, that it wasn't actual aid that was going, but people were pissed. Mm -hmm. People were very angry, so much so that the government during FOCAC had to respond by taming down the conversation online. And that did give you an indication that there is some domestic sensitivity to spending a lot of money. And so you've brought up this issue that China wants to be a leader in foreign aid or foreign assistance, development assistance, however we want to call it. But in order to do that, you need to bring a lot of cash to the table. It can't just be white papers. If the Chinese really want to be a leader in this, don't they have to kick up the amount of money that they're spending that's comparable to what the U.S. and Europeans are doing? Yeah, so that comes to another issue of how you measure the level of China's um, investment or spending in development cooperation. So I think foreign aid, um, if you follow the Chinese term of you know how they define foreign aid, that was very specific, just grants and interest-free loans and, and concessional loans. So this part of money may not be that much. Um, but there are also other kinds, other forms of development finance that China um, is putting on the table. Um, so that would include things like uh, the um, preferential export credits that has been used to fund a lot of inf- infrastructure projects in, in Africa. And also in recent years, um, the, the Asian in- Infrastructure Investment Bank and various um, funds China has set up for international cooperation, especially in the you know the industrial sectors. Um, so all these can be considered some kind of development finance, um, but they are not the, the traditional notion of aid. 
And so all that combined, I think that that amount should be comparable. Uh, if yeah, even larger than what the U.S. is putting um, is billing as aid. Um, and then comes. Let me come back to the idea of the morality and and you know the the sensitivity of spending money for foreign exist, existence when so many in China are still living uh, in poor conditions. Um, so that's why I think when they use this term um, E and Li, interest and, and public goods, they 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 are very careful. They try to strike a balance. They try to argue that um, China wants to uphold justice, want to uphold public good, but um, they, they, the way they would do is try to make the two comp- comparable, com- compatible. Um, so I think uh, to me, it, it's clear why they're saying that, because like you said, a lot of these aid um, money, whether they are grants and loans, they, they in a way also benefit China because, you know, the, the contracts go to Chinese companies and uh, they, they build a road and that facilitate trade activities between China and that country. So um, at the end, China did benefit from that kind of investment. Um, but of course, it's not so uh immediately clear for for um you know just common folks and so that that there remains the, the, you know the political sensitivity so i think um it, it they they are carefully managing it but but i think they have find a way to convince themselves that this is the right way to go and they they are trying to develop a coherent uh, discourse around that as Eric mentioned at the top, um, about two years ago, you know, two, three years ago, China set up the the China International um, Development Cooperation Agency, the, its its first more, more kind of traditional development agency. Um, and you know, development watches or China watches have been rumoring, have, have rumored then for a while that that the agency was relatively weak in comparison to the ministries that used to to manage all of this this overseas assistance. Um, wh- what do you think the the white paper reveals about the the shifting position of SIDCA in in the Chinese kind of international financing landscape? Yeah, in a way, it is kind of um, weak because it's small. It's only a few dozen. Um, uh, staff, as I, I understand, but the, the point is, um, Sitka is not like um, USAID or um, uh, some other Western development agencies because it doesn't do aid imp- implementation itself. The implementation of um, the specific aid projects still are within the Ministry of Commerce, and that's the the you know the. That that would require more uh, manpower. So that would that still remain in 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 the in the ministry that's been doing it for a long time. It has all the institutions set up to do it. Um, what Sitka is doing that's uh, that was not there before was is that it's going to play a bigger role in the planning and coordination of China's foreign aid program with the uh, with China's foreign policy. So that's 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 the, the the additional part that it's additional responsibility that's fulfilling. Um, so in that sense, um, if it's just about planning, it doesn't really need that many people. And and of course, as time goes, and it, it continues to develop, and so um, uh, we can't just simply compare, you know, it with. Uh, USAID and see, you know, the number of uh, staff and, 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 and conclude that it's, it's weak, it's, it's meaningless, because it, it just plays a very different role. It's interesting because you mentioned the, the, that under the leadership of Xi Jinping a couple of different times, and my reading of the document, and I will admit, I'm not an expert in development, and I'm not an expert in Xi Jinping thought, and I'm not an expert in any of the subjects here. So this is a, a layman's view of these things, but it did feel like there was a, a, a vibe, an influence, an overlay of Xi Jinping thought into the document that it was meant to reflect the direction that the broader Chinese government is going in, in terms of orienting around Xi Jinping thought. Is that an accurate reading? Is there more Xi Jinping influence in this document and in the direction that foreign aid is going meant to align it with the other geopolitical and economic priorities that are being outlined by the president? Or is that a misreading of it? Uh, yeah, I I think um, the the reason why I mentioned so many times Xi Jinping leadership just I want to highlight this um, it's during his 
you know, administration. It's not. Um, I'm not attributing all these to him personally. No, no, no. no. Uh, but it's the thought. It's that you know he's re- he's published a new book that came out, and Chinese ambassadors up and down Africa were using this book. I, it's the third book on Xi Jinping thought. I don't know the exact title of it, but it was really there was an a, yeah, mm-hmm. and there was an aid and development kind of theme to that as well. And I'm wondering, again, is some of that ideology coming into from Xi Jinping thought, the way that Chinese officials are studying it, the way that it's being emanated from uh, Zhong Nanhai, and the way that the gov- the rest of the government is orienting itself around Xi Jinping and, and Xi Jinping thought, is that is the aid document also a reflection of that? In a way, yes. Like in the title, the term new era, um, it's it's a it's it's a hallmark of you know the, the things that has been happened you know the, all the official documents that's been issued during uh, his presidency has this term new era because um, I think there is a discourse that has been created that you know he, this presidency is so special and China has come to this new stage of development and everything now is qualitatively different than before. So so this term new era is um, already signifies that, um, you know, it's, um, how can I put it? It's just the way the Chinese policy are presented um, since she come into power has been that, you know, no matter where the policy ideas originated from, eventually they would be presented as if um, it was the wisdom of the leader himself and and it's a it's the way that the Chinese leadership um, is trying to you know um, centralize um, policy making and consolidate um, this uh, thinkings and 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 try to you know present this image of you know everything is coming from the top and, and everything is very clear. Um, uh, I don't know if I'm explaining this. I don't know if it makes sense. No, no, that does make sense. That does make sense. So you pointed out that that this uh, China's international development cooperation is going to be very closely aligned with the BRI. Um, do you have any idea of like what that what that would mean in terms of of whether you know kind of whether it's going to be a shift in, in the the kinds of BRI projects or or you know kind of how how the the, the kind of thinking of around development as expressed in this paper how it dovetails with thinking about the BRI. I think two things. One is that. Um, maybe there would be, in terms of ge- geographic allocation of um, aid and other resources, um, they would tilt uh, tilt towards um, BRI countries. Um, and so, of course, there are already there are more than 130 countries in the world that have signed BRI uh, cooperation uh, agreements with China. But China still maintains a list of about 64 countries. Um, around 64 countries along the Belt and Road, that's the official term. So and a lot of uh, studies are being produced and statistics are being produced about uh, the 64 countries. So supposedly um, these 64 countries will remain uh, priority countries and maybe other countries um, because these 64 countries are mainly in, in, in Asia and, and Europe. Um, and, and so... Um, I think in in Latin America there are also countries that China would uh, consider very important. So there might be also um, um, they may also spend more resources in in those countries. Um, and and secondly, I think uh, the BRI um, provides a framework um, for China to consider what it can do in terms of development cooperation. So the BRI has five pillars. Um, one is policy uh, coordination, and second is infrastructure connectivity, and third is um, financial integration, and and fourth is trade, and and fifth is people-to-people ties. So it gives you a clear idea of where, you know, what programs can be designed and and invested resources into. Um, So uh, infrastructure connectivity, that's been the traditional area um, China has been doing and everyone's talking about that. But I think people have not realized enough there are all kinds of other activities going on. Um, For example, in terms of policy coordination, you know, China can be talking to other countries in terms of aligning their development agenda. 
and try to make you know uh, to to coordinate efforts so that you know the, the countries can jointly invest in some areas and uh, prioritize certain policy areas, things like that. Um, so, yeah, so it, it does, the BRI does provide a, a framework. Staying with the BRI, there's been an interesting trend that we've been picking up over the past, say, six months that the researchers at the China Africa Research Initiative at Johns Hopkins University, uh, the Global Development Policy Center at Boston University, the researchers at Rhodium Group have all detected that there's been a dramatic downturn in the amount of lending that's coming out of China's two major policy banks, the China Development Bank and the China Exim Bank. The number that came out of the Boston University study was that from 2016, it went from $75 billion the last year it went down to $4 billion per year, a 94% drop. They attribute it to a lot of different factors, that the risk tolerance has gone up in China, that the Chinese economy itself is facing a number of headwinds as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak, that the economy isn't doing quite as well as the government and the Communist Party would like everybody to think it is, and so it's pulling back on the spending. I'm curious to hear about what your assessment is as to whether or not those same factors, which may be drawing back the spending and the loans on the BRI side and through the policy bank side, may also impact in all of this development assistance. Again, $7 billion a year, not much compared to the Americans, but still sizable nonetheless. Will this aid and development assistance be impacted by the same forces affecting the policy banks? So I think aid, um, because of the, the amount of aid, what China consider as aid, grants, interest-free loans, and, and concessional loans, are is relatively small uh, compared to all the other kinds of financial resources. Um, it's I, I don't think it's going to drop um, significantly. Um, certainly not the, the, the degree that um, in the Boston University data set um, was showing um, about you know, loans from China Development Bank. Um, so, and I remember I did, um, you know, went through all the budget documents of all the Chinese um, ministries to see their aid budget. So uh, let me um, back up a little bit. So the Chinese foreign aid budget, the main foreign aid budget resides in the Ministry of Commerce, like I was saying before. It, this ministry uh, manages all the aid spending, the, the implementation, things like that. So it manages the, the main aid budget. And all the other ministries, like Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Science and Technology, they have their smaller aid budget, um, which they use to um, you know, provide um, to, to implement aid projects that in their special uh, specialty. Um, so I went through all the budgets and, and I remember um, it, the, the, the eight um, uh, figures drop a little bit, but very only very slightly. So I don't, so th- I'm, I'm talking about 2020. So I don't think um, aid would be cut significantly. And also China's, Chinese economy um, was also already rebounding in, 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 during this year. So I don't think aid would be um, affected so much. But like I said before, Chinese development finance goes far beyond aid. So all the other sources, um, the lending from the policy banks may be affected. But I also want to caution about uh, the kind of data uh, that we're seeing from Boston University because it's based on um, information that's publicly available, so based on the announcements by the companies or the banks. So we don't know if that's all. We don't know if there are other uh, lendings that they they have not announced. Um, So the data set might not be complete uh, or exhaustive. Um, So I just want to caution, we can't just um, conclude that there's, we, we can't be so sure. Um, there's such a significant drop in Chinese uh, development finance. So one of the things that struck me um, in the paper was that it makes quite a a, a clear decision, a, a clear, um, uh, you know, kind of line, it draws a clear line between north-south um, development cooperation and south-south development cooperation. Can you unpack that a little bit, like where China is in, you know, wh- wh- what the discourse of south-south cooperation is in China and and how, you know, kind of wh- what the paper makes clear about where China China sees its role there. Um, yeah, China definitely sees itself as a, as a leader in the global south. I would say, um, 
and of course, this South-South uh, cooperation tradition is uh, is is a long-lasting um, discourse um, in China, and and actually, China did uh, in this document, China explicitly def- defines international development cooperation as, uh, you know, the, the it terms it as under the uh, framework of South-South cooperation. So this is a precondition for for what China considers uh, IDC. Um, and so I I think the this I was also struggling to find out what exactly is the difference between North South and South South. But I think the the kind of uh, narrative that countries in the global South want to push for is that nor in the North South cooperation um, the North tends to demand. Uh, they demand the South countries to do things according to their uh, to their design or to their agenda. So there is a feeling that um, yes, North South um, relationship is unequal, and is the way the North countries uh, are uh, will continue to uh, dominate uh, the global economic and social um, uh, affairs. So. Um, and and so in response to that, South South cooperation is supposed to be more equal based on you know um, uh, mutual respect between the countries and countries, um, uh, especially re- re- respecting the sovereignty of each country to to make decisions for their own. So all these you know ideas, um, but I think it's more rhetoric um, perhaps than in substance. I'd like to close out our discussion on the U.S.-China relationship, which is very, very complicated right now. And you're somebody who sits in between both of these worlds as somebody pursuing a doctoral degree uh, just outside of Washington, D.C. at George Mason University. You've been able to see over the years the hardening of the perceptions of China in the United States, particularly in Washington. At the same time, you're in China now, and you obviously are exposed to the Chinese thinking on, on the U.S. as well. The new, uh, you know, the the administrator nominee for the U.S. Agency for International Development is Samantha Power. She's former ambassador from the U.S. to the United Nations, uh, and she is a China hawk. Just last uh, summer, for example, back in July, she wrote a tweet that said the Chinese government may bully the world, but it can never lead the world. Uh, She is on the record over and over again being very hostile to China. The politicization of aid in the United States uh, in in terms of the U.S.-China dispute uh, is not new, actually. And in fact, under the Trump administration, they started using USAID as part of the effort to go after Huawei as well and to work with governments around the world to dissuade them from using Huawei. They were going to provide financing. They came up with all these different packages. I'm wondering, when we look at the new white paper coming out of China, you see someone like Samantha Power coming into office in the United States. Will aid and these new aid, aid, the new aid agency in China and USAID be a new front in the U.S.-China conflict? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, because um, this, uh, like I said, I think China development, international development really is the space China has the the greatest strengths. So China might not be able to compete with the U.S. in the military sphere, but it can. It has the resources and mechanisms and ideas to to play a very important role in the sphere of um, development. So I think in that sense, um, there's going to be competition between China and the U.S. Um, as you know, the the great powers of the of the world nowadays. So I would not be surprised about that. Um, but I, I hope. Um, I mean, competition can be good, as long as it's based on you know clear understanding of you know facts. Um, because I think still um, Chinese. Foreign aid and development finance still very poorly understood. Um, of course, it's not entirely the U.S. fault or, or uh, the fault of outsiders because China doesn't really provide inf- enough information um, and an explanation of what it's been doing. Um, the transparency is, the issue is not satisfactory. Um, so. From my point of view as a researcher, what I hope to do is really to, you know, use my language skill as a native Chinese speaker and as someone who 
who was born in China and grew up in China to really um, explain what's going on, what's China's thinking, what, what are the mechanisms, how are they working um, to the outside world, so that we have at least uh, have come to a clear understanding. And then we can see, you know, we can compare the, the relative strengths of different countries and, and compare the outcomes of um, different uh, development approaches, different uh, programs, and see who's doing better. So, so that's my hope. Yeah, it's badly needed. I mean, in order to understand what's going on would be, you know, to have more of what you're doing and for the for the government themselves and for the China International Development Cooperation Agency to do better in communications would be such a valuable thing for all of us who are paying attention, but most importantly, also for stakeholders in the developing world who want to better understand how to best leverage Chinese aid and assistance. I think right now it's very confusing for people because the types of aid are so different. And again, the aid industry is one of these things that is much more oriented around the Bretton Woods institutions, around the traditional donors. And so again, the, the, the Chinese way, the Confucian thought, the Xi Jinping thought, all of those influences that you've talked about today are very foreign and exotic. So uh, we definitely appreciate you helping to explain it for us. Stella Hongzhang is a PhD candidate at George Mason University in the United States and one of the world's leading experts on Chinese aid and international development. She tweets regularly about it, and it is really a fascinating feed to follow. Stella, where can people find you on Twitter? I think my handle is just Stella Hongzhang. Wonderful. Well, we'll put a link to that. I'll also put a link to her multi-part Twitter thread where she did a fantastic analysis uh, on the on the white paper. Also, I'll put a link to Mariana Rudiak's and uh, similarly uh, an equally important analysis on the white paper as well. She's another scholar who follows aid and development, and we're looking forward to having her on the show as well. And Stella, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Our first guest from Quanzhou in Fujian Province. We really appreciate it. Thank you, and I enjoy it a lot. Thank you. It's head spinning to think about what Stella was telling us because. The mindset and the and the approach to aid from the Chinese worldview out is so different than the U.S. European and traditional donor approach. We mean bringing in again all of these concepts of Confucianism and of Xi Jinping thought and all of this stuff, which a lot of people on the outside, most people on the outside, don't understand. And that's where I think we run into these issues on the semantics, like public good where we associate that with one thing. The Chinese mean something totally different. The Chinese are just sucky about communicating. <laughs> they just don't tell anybody anything. There's, you know, it's very hard to understand what's going on. And so then we run into these problems of misunderstandings between what the Chinese want to do, what they are doing, and what people think they should be doing. So it's really interesting. And that's why I think the work that Stella's doing is so important to help us better understand and communicate what the Chinese are doing about aid, development, the concessional loans, all the grants, the different financial tools, where it's coming from in terms of coming out of MOFCOM, the Ministry of Commerce, coming out of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, coming out of SIDCA. It's super complicated, but very, very interesting. You know, I, th I think it's super important um, to, you know, to, to, uh, to highlight what China is doing and to understand what China is doing because China is such a big big actor in the world. But also, I think it's, it, there's, it's even, there's an even more fundamental reason, which is that, that aid, the aid system as we know it, um, has been was structurally set up, you know, around Western supremacy in the world, you know. So and 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 to a large extent was was a kind of a response to Western res supremacy in the world, in the sense that that there is this kind of aspect to it where you know, kind of it, it's it's a kind of a tacit acknowledgement of of the kind of of the impact that Western colonialism, you know, and 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 other for, for other forms of kind of um, you know, kind of inequality like structural inequality with the west at the top has had on the developing world you know that that is kind of part that has been baked into the logic of of you know of how the aid system worked right through the 20th century and into the 21st century um, and i think that system itself is being restructured to 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 make place for for newer donors that don't have the same relationship with the rest of the world china being number one but also turkey um you know kind of united arab emirates south korea all of these all of these people are, are coming into the game and in the process they're changing the system and the system needs to be changed it needs to be a more 
a kind of impersonal, maybe impersonal is the wrong word, but a more kind of a neutral system, you know, where where it where where it isn't so freighted with historical responsibility, and you know, so so in that sense, I think it's it's a really it's it's really important work, you know, to 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 sh to kind of articulate how the system is changing exactly because of China's influence. But that's I don't know how much that's going to change simply because the Chinese, with the money they're bringing to the table in the aid context still seems relatively small. Again, 7, 10, 15 billion dollars a year is not going to move the needle compared to what the French, British, Germans and Americans are spending. And and I think this is what really upsets a lot of American stakeholders is that the Chinese they feel get a lot more credit for the types of aid and development assistance that they're providing compared to say a PEPFAR program which is more than the entire aid budget of China combined. So PEPFAR, I think, last year was somewhere around $10 billion. I, that's off the top of my head. I may be completely wrong on that. But if that's the case, that's more than the $7 billion than the Chinese spent worldwide. PEPFAR, of course, is the Presidential Emergency Fund for AIDS Relief, which is the George W. Bush HIV AIDS program in Africa. And when you go to Washington, people are gritting their teeth saying, why do the Chinese get credit for flying in you know, a few plane loads full of PPE and at the same time, we're spending $10 billion and saving millions of lives in Southern Africa, particularly in South Africa, and we don't get the credit for it. I think there's something to that. So when, the, when she said that China wants to become a leader, I'm wondering if that's another semantic discrepancy, like how they define leader and how we may define leader are two very different things. As she said, it's in a development context, which may bring in all of the other diplomatic tools that the Chinese have at their disposal, the concessional loans, the policy bank loans, the, you know, the construction contracts, the BRI stuff, all the things, for example, that we saw Wang Yi unveil in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo earlier this month on his tour. But that's not conventional and traditional aid. So maybe that is shaking it up. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think I think that that's a that's a key that's a key way of shaking it up, you know, is is because because it it, it brings in with it a, a different conceptualization of human rights um, and a different conceptualization of 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 you know kind of of what it means to move people forward, you know, in the world. And I think I think that conceptualization dovetails a lot more closely with with ideas in Africa. Um, you know, um, and b because you know, Africa has traditionally also had a more kind of materialist view of of what kind of development means. You know, and particularly and, and what human rights means. Particularly, you know, so so for for example, you know, many people in Africa, I think, share a view with China where something like clean water provision is seen as a human rights gain, um, while it's not it's not categorized that way in Western thought. Um, and so you you know, so so I, I think I think the this is exactly the kind of kind of conceptual shift that China is bringing in this landscape. When we talk about non-Western aid, Japan is one of the largest aid providers in the world. A lot of people don't know that. And yet it, it, it really is a quiet player in that sense. Obviously, your experience in Japan and your familiarity with the culture there, did they have any impact on changing the system or did the Japanese just fall in line with what the U.S. and Europeans were doing? Um. You know, uh, th there'll be Japanese, you know, um, development experts who can talk about a, a lot better about this than, than I can. But it, in my experience, um, I, I think they were very influenced. They learned a lot, I think, from from European approaches. And I think in the 80s and 90s, they did follow European approaches uh, and American approaches. I, I think that they kind of they they work to kind of to fit into that system. But I think they've they've learned a lot from China, um, and you know one of the things that they have that they've learned from China is that um, you know is is this kind of overlap is is the importance of development as a human rights and aid tool, um, and and also the, the the importance of infrastructure in aiding development. I think you know I think they've taken a lot from China in that respect, and I think China and Japan, even though they they so the relationship between the two is so is so frosty, they they do they they kind of implicitly in conversation conversation with each other and they do learn a lot from each other you know so the way that that for example that the china structured focac has so much as has taken was taken so taking so much from the way that japan interacted with africa um and so so in that sense i think there, there is this kind of like peer learning happening um, within East Asian donors. And it'll be very interesting to, to see a comparison with South Korea in there as well. Um, you know, and, and I think all of it is is in, in its own incremental way, kind of slowly 
expanding the the thinking around development and moving it away from a from a purely Western focus. I think it's a tough sell for the Chinese domestically to persuade their people that billions of dollars of money should be going to other countries. This again is the same debate that we have in the United States, where if you ask the guy on the street in the United States, how much do we as Americans spend on foreign aid and assistance? They will say 10% of the budget. And in fact, it's one one thousandth of the budget. But the perception is, why are we spending so much money on helping Africa and Latin America when we have poor people at home? That is also a very prescient issue in China. Now, interestingly enough, Xi Jinping this year and the government has been touting the fact that they have eliminated poverty in China. So that's a big campaign that Guizhou, which is the one of the poorest provinces in China, kind of reached a certain target. They're now no longer at that poverty level, and there's been a huge celebration of that. So I wonder if that might ease some of the pressure now on sending money overseas now that China is not as... Uh, uh, yeah. as poor as it but, used to be but you know so, sorry to interrupt i mean the the but i think those same americans who would complain about about the about the the size of the budget going to the developing world if you ask them should america have like large scale international influence should american thought shape the way that the that these poor countries operate they would say yes right they they would say it's it's it's, a, no, it's no, a, no 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 that's not it a lot of them are trump voters 75 million people would put america first yeah but I mean, but that yes. is what America first means, right? In the world, they they they're not thinking of America shrinking its influence around the world. Um, you know, they might they might think of it as as that it should be deployed differently, or it should be deployed more you know more self interestedly. But like, but but they don't want America to be Iceland, right? They don't want America to be like a little tiny little country on the edge of the world, you know, with no with not being listened to by anyone. And so that that's the flip side, you know, that's the flip side of that of that investment. If you know, if if people want international influence as they do, I think, also in China, then that's how it works. Yeah, that's very foresighted that I think the, the, the guy on the street doesn't necessarily see it that way, but it's, it comes down to having to sell it politically. Now, in the United States, we have a whole bunch of interest groups, or what we call the Beltway Bandits, and these are the private contractors that surround the Washington Beltway that pull in billions of dollars to execute USAID programs. They have a vested interest in promoting the value of aid. So groups like the International Rescue Committee, Oxfam, you know, Doctors Without Borders, who benefit from a lot of this money and a lot of the donations that come from the aid industrial complex, uh, really promote the value of aid. That doesn't happen in China very much. So the government, if they want to bring their people along with this and not face the resistance that they faced in 2018, they're going to have to do a better sales job and a communications job. I'm not going to hold my breath. These guys are terrible at communications, as we all know, but nonetheless, it, it's super interesting. Last point that I'd like to talk to you about before we go, it's the one that I brought up regarding Samantha Power and the politicization of aid. Now, aid has always been politicized in, in the U.S. and Europe and the West uh, f from the very beginning. And so I know they say it's not, we go where the need is, but I don't believe that. There is always aid as a part of politics, and you can't ex you know separate the two. But I'm wondering how how you think and how you see this playing out in terms of take, for example, a country like Zimbabwe, which is a very contra controversial country, contentious between the United States and China. It's very close to the, the Chinese. I can see the Chinese coming in with aid programs. The United States has been very reluctant because it doesn't like the government there. How do you see aid becoming a tool in the new era of China-U.S. competition? Oh, this is such a difficult question. Um, I think... In the first place, I think I think you know my 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 sense, and again, this is from very far on the outside, but like, you know, my my sense is that that the first task, uh, you know, if that the Biden administration is going to tackle is de-escalation, right? To try to try and kind of cool things down, you know. So so even though I think Samantha Powers was traditionally a, a China hawk, I can imagine that that she, that she would probably maybe hold back on that for the next few months at least, and you know, kind of to to just like kind of smooth things over a little bit internally. Nationally. But the thing is, I think I, I think Zimbabwe is actually a great example because this is there's a there's a fundamental philosophical difference between between China and, and the U.S. In, in thinking about how to deal with the situation in Zimbabwe, where both a, a kind of a, a repressive illiberal government and widespread developmental problems, right? Um, and so the 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 tendency in the U.S. has been to 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 focus on the political side of that, on political rights and um, and then to to you know with and leading 
with punishing repressive governments. Um, China has, has traditionally, you know, kind of like taken a, a kind of a less, maybe judgmental is maybe the wrong word, but like, a, 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 you know, kind of has not made that judgment, you know, under under the rubric of its non-interference policy, and you know, has, has also focused on development as a, as a kind of a tool that that lifts all boats, um, and you know, and and that is how what how they're operating in, in Zimbabwe, no matter how you know, kind of also in, in additionally how kind of shady and and corrupt some of their engagement in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is, but you know the thing is when you when you live in Southern Africa, Zimbabwe is a massive problem, and the, its biggest problem isn't that it has a terrible government, which it has. the The biggest problem is that it's this constant source of disruption because it's so poor and so underdeveloped. So, so you know, kind of so so you know, kind of being softer on on, on the Zimbabwean government and more more amenable to. To engaging with actual development in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe will actually improve the entire subregion, um, and uh, th like European governments have found it impossible to do because they they have you know because of their of their philosophical orientation, and and that I think you know I, I can see how it makes sense for them morally, but like developmentally in South Africa in Southern Africa is a disaster. Yeah, I don't think that's a very popular point of view in Washington, so I'm not holding my breath that there's going to be a a change of mindset or a quick radical change of mindset regarding Zimbabwe. I do expect to, to see aid again with someone like Samantha Power to become a new front in the U.S.-China dispute. Uh, USAID is already orienting itself uh, on issues like Huawei and whatnot. So will the Chinese reciprocate and respond using their aid agency? We'll have to see. So that'll do it. Listen, we have been negligent in covering Chinese aid and development, these issues over the past few years. So it's one of the issues that we're going to pick up more. We're going to extend some invitations to some other experts. If there are people in your network that you think that we should have on the show, don't hesitate to email us. We love hearing from listeners. Uh, you can reach me at eric, E-R-I-C, at chinaafricaproject.com, uh, and Cobus, C-O-B-U-S, at chinaafricaproject.com. Oftentimes when uh, people email me, they get surprised that they get a long email back. So uh, be prepared for a nice discussion if you want to ch talk about any of the issues that we raised today. Also, another great way to stay in touch with us is, is to subscribe to our daily email newsletter. Uh, prices start at just $7 a month for students, $15 a month for everybody else. It's the best way to follow what people like Stella are saying. So the moment that she wrote her Twitter thread and her analysis on the the new white paper, we featured it right in the in our newsletter the next day. So it saves you the effort of having to search all throughout Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and all the different social media channels and all the news sites to find a consolidated digest of everything going on, not only in the China-Africa space now, but more in the China Global South space. We're now breaking away from just focusing exclusively on Africa to look at what the Chinese are doing in the Americas, in uh, the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, and, and all around the Global South to, in order to connect the dots on all of this together. So it's very complicated, very confusing, yet also fascinating and very interesting as well. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. Uh, we'll be back again next week with another episode. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. Or follow the guys on Twitter. Eric's at Iolanda, and you can find Kobas at Stadenesk. For more information about the China Africa Project and to sign up for our free weekly email news brief, go to chinaafricaproject.com.